Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1 and save 15% off your order when you check out Row 1 Brand's Vintage Sports Victorium Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. If he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 Vintage NFL Helmet Poster. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hey, hello, and how are you? And welcome to this latest edition of the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast, where we discuss some of the best moments, best names, and best memories in sports history. I'm Dana Augusta, your host, and I hope that you're having a good day, good evening, or a good night, wherever you're listening and whenever you're listening. And we're back again with another show highlighting the best in sports history, and I appreciate each of you taking time out to give us a quick listen. Now, as a reminder, please subscribe to this podcast if you like what you hear and check out our Twitter page at Historically SP2 for your daily dose of sports history. Now, on today's show, we're going to be talking with the host of the Basketball History 101 podcast, Mr. Wick Loiza, as we revisit college basketball's game of the century, which was between UCLA and the University of Houston in the Astrodome in January of 1968. The top two teams in the country at the time and a game that paved the way to the way we watch college basketball to this very day. Later in the show, we will send out a shout out to Willie O'Ree, who this week in 1958 became the first black man ever to suit up for an NHL regular season game with the Boston Bruins. And of course, we will have our usual top five memorable moments from the week of January the 16th through January the 22nd. So pump up the volume and you're listening to the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast, a proud member of the Sports History Network. The Pigskin Tales Podcast is all about the lesser known pro football players. Yes, there are stories about the ones we know, like Brad Tarkenton and Harold Red Grange. But have you ever heard of Ernie Nevers? How about Dave Osborne or even Grady Alderman? These men created their own path to the NFL. How did they do it? Listen to the Pigskin Tales podcast. Now streaming on your favorite music platform. Go to pigskintales.com. And we're back here at the Historically Speaking Sports podcast. I'm your host, Dana Augusta, once again, and... Whenever we talk about games of the century, especially like in college football, for example, there's so many, there's a lot of games that go by that moniker, the game of the century. You got Army Navy in 1945. You got Notre Dame versus Michigan State in 1966. You got Texas, Arkansas in 69 and Oklahoma, Nebraska in 71, which I did a podcast episode on a few weeks ago. And you also have Miami versus Penn State in 1987. But when you talk college basketball game of the century, there's only one. And that took place 54 years ago this past week. And in all of the places, it took place in the eighth wonder of the world, the Houston Astrodome. And that gave basketball fans who witnessed that game a glimpse of basketball's future. And to talk about that game is my man, new friend of mine named Rick Lariza, who is the host of the Basketball 101 podcast. And I'm very, very thankful to have him on board tonight. Rick, thank you for coming in. No, well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. 
Houston versus Houston versus UCLA in 1968. Let's get do a little bit of background on both teams. You have first of all UCLA. They were the number one team in the country that year. They were back to back. They were going for back to back national titles and actually going for th- uh, their fourth win in five years. You know, talk about that 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 team and who is some of the, the, the great players that was on that on that squad. Well, thank you. It all starts with, well, then Lou Alcindor that we now all know as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Obviously, he was the man. He was the guy that everybody uh, set the bar against. It was whatever Lou Alcindor was doing. That's how everybody measured themselves. So you got you got him leading the way. You got Lucius Allen on that squad as well. Uh, but it all really kind of started in that middle with uh, with Alcindor and uh, and the matchup was so great, and I don't want to necessarily get ahead of you, but the matchup was so great because you had Elvin Hayes on Houston, who uh, one thing, I mean, those two guys were back-to-back number one picks. You know, Elvin Hayes goes number one in 68. Alcindor goes number one in 69. I mean, this was, uh, yeah, that UCLA squad was just stacked. I think, what was it, 47-game winning streak at yeah, the time? Yeah. It was just, uh, I mean, they were just a complete team. They had a 47, they were coming in with a 47 game winning streak. You had mentioned Alcindor and, and, and as the obvious strength of that team. Um, like I said, they were the defending national champs, you know, but also a lot of people forget about that UCLA team was their backcourt was so dynamic. You had mentioned Lucius Allen, who would eventually went on into the NBA, but you also had point guard Mike Warren who was an outstanding mm-hmm. point guard on that team. And he was the four general of that team. Also, you had a sharpshooter from the outside named Lynn Shackelford at forward. So this team was loaded. And, of course, you have the, the incomparable John Wooden as head coach, you know, orchestrating the whole thing. You know, one of the most mild-mannered coaches that you could possibly meet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he – I remember one of the things that he did is that it drove other coaches crazy – is that he would mostly just sit in his chair with the uh, the program rolled up in his hands and wouldn't say a whole lot. You know, he was kind of like, I don't want to necessarily make comparisons to Phil Jackson, but I know that's what upset NBA coaches, but he just would sit there when, when the game was going on. He wasn't, what they would say, he wasn't doing a lot of coaching in the game. He just let the guys play, and he would always say, well, I've already done all my coaching in practice. If they hadn't figured it out in practice – then we don't have a shot of them figuring it out during the game. And uh, yeah, the incomparable John, the mild mannered John Wooden. And what's funny is people call him mild mannered, but he's in the Hall of Fame as a player. Right. And back exactly. in the night, and way back in the 19, I think it was the 20s and early 30s when he played, he was not called mild mannered. I mean, he wasn't a dirty player, but he didn't back down. I mean, he was as tough as it came as a player. He was. Uh, they called him, I think, the Indiana Rubber Man is what oh, they called wow. him because he because he went to the floor. He would go to the floor for the ball and just bounce back up so fast. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, he he was he would not back down. He was not, uh, you know, two very different men from his playing days to his coaching days. Yeah, he was an All American at uh, Purdue University. I think he was a three time mm-hmm. All American at Purdue, and you know, from Martinsville, Indiana, um, he was a you know. Major, he was a great, great coach. And one side note about Wooden is that at right at the time that he took the job at UCLA, it took him so long to win his first national championship. But a lot yeah. of people don't know that he, at the same time he was becoming head coach at, he was offered the job at UCLA. He was also offered the job at University of Minnesota. Mm-hmm. But because thanks to a terrible snowstorm in Minneapolis, he couldn't get to Minneapolis but the sun's shining in Los Angeles. So why as well take the job in LA? Beautiful weather compared to a blizzard conditions in Minneapolis. I mean, go figure. (laughs) Yeah. No, you're right. I think it took him like a decade or 11, 12 years at UCLA before he got the first one. Once he got the first one, I mean, it was just, uh, it just, it was just rolling from there, but yeah, it, it took a while to build that program. You know, he had won two national championships, um, a couple of years prior to that, he won it in 64 and 65. 
you know, with mm-hmm. Gail Goodrich and Walt Hazard and those guys and that, that group and, and uh, Keith Erickson, those are the, the, you know, the, the, the bell cows of that team. And they went back to back in 64 and 65. They didn't go back in 66 and they won it again in 67. Now here we are in 68, 47 game winning streak. And the team that they're playing, the University of Houston under head coach Guy Lewis and future NBA Hall of Famer Elvin Hayes. Yeah, they were they were uh, obviously a formidable team with Elvin Hayes. That dude, they call him the Big E for a reason. I mean, the guy dominated the boards. He dominated the low post. Uh, I mean, really, there was nobody who really challenged him up until this game. I mean, Elvin Hayes had his way with everybody he had he had played up to that point. So you know, you were. Uh, uh, I mean, this was really a battle of giants. I mean, I mean, just look at where they like you said it earlier. They ended up playing the thing in the Astrodome because the gym at Houston wasn't big enough, and they knew it. Right. It was. It was supposed to be at Hoffheinz Arena, which is which was kind of like next door to the to the Astrodome, and they decided that the venue, of course, was going to be too small because they're going to have an overflow crowd. Um, University of Houston decided we're going to move it to the Astrodome, and that caused a lot of kind of not really logistical problems but it just if you look at if you look at film of that 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 game you notice something very weird about it which was the fact that the court was actually in the middle of a football field and the stands were so far away from the from the from the playing court yeah there's a ton of space between the court and like you said yeah the fans so the back the the fans are like watching from far away uh, the background, a lot of shooters talk about that, the background behind the backboard. So when you're shooting, there's there's a certain kind of background you expect to see of a typical arena with fans there. Now this, it's absolutely cavernous because it just there's just so much space. Uh, you're looking at the basket and it's just it just it's a weird look. It takes time to adjust to that. So, uh, yeah, it was uh, it's, it's a very weird look with the with the first row being what, like 50 feet away from the court. Yeah. Right, so that's, at uh, least it was at least fifty feet. <laughs> at least fifty feet. That's <laughs> at right. least fifty. Because that's when right. you're a shooter, you you, you know, like you say, you you you're anticipating seeing a background whenever you look at it at the basket t- attempting a shot. But first of all, it was dark. The, the Astro Dome at that time didn't have a lot of great lighting. It was at night, and mm-hmm. it was just a dark background. It was almost like you were playing in a void, and. The shooters had a had a little bit of a time, a little bit of a rough time in the beginning of the game trying to adjust. Um, and as it turned out, I mean, it, it then ended up being a great game. The Astrodome itself, the game itself, 52,693 fans were on hand for that game, which was the largest, uh, largest attendance ever for a college basketball game at the time. Um, and plus, there was something else that was very interesting you know, very in- intriguing about that game was that it was the first game ever broadcast nationally in prime time. The very first college mm-hmm. basketball regular season game, for that matter, ever to be broadcast in prime time. That, especially for it being in 1968, that was a big, big deal. Yeah, back then, putting college basketball on national TV would have been like today putting like the lacrosse, a lacrosse match on primetime national TV, it was like, what is this? Because ba- college basketball was so regional. So yes. in the South, you got the ACC. You know, over in the Carolinas, you got the ACC. The big, you had the Big Ten in the Midwest, Pac-10 out on the West Coast. And everything was regional. So you, you would see your local teams on your local TV. And, and that was it. There was no such thing as, like, national TV. I mean, we take it for granted today on ESPN. Between all the seven, eight, nine, ten ESPNs, right. we're getting what, like twenty-five college basketball games a week. We right. them all. We take it for granted how how really monumental this was that college basketball had taken that step of being a nationally prominent sport, at least for the big schools like this. Yeah, they you had you know, and broadcasting a game was a, was a big big name. It wasn't a big name at the time, but for us basketball fans, he was a big name, and that's Dick Inberg. Who used to do radio for the uh, for UCLA, but he was tapped to do the game nationally with uh, former NBA All Star Bob Pettit. Yeah, but you have, but you have this game here, one versus two. You have UCLA with a forty seven game winning streak, and also University of Houston. They had won thirty eight consecutive games at home and was riding an eighteen game winning streak themselves. 
Yeah, that you it really was a lot on the line for both teams uh, because it was just such a big matchup. And I think, and I don't know how you want to get into this, the going into the game, uh, I believe Alcindor Kareem, I, I still want to say just say Kareem, yeah. uh, he missed practice that week because of his his eye. That's he right. He got it scratched, and uh, um, so he he was at the practice, but he was basically sitting on the sideline next to or standing on the sideline next to Wood and just watching practice all week. And they weren't even sure he would be available for the game. But of course, you know, the TV, you can't have this game without Alcindor out there. Exactly. So there was some pressure for him to get out, get out there. Yeah. He had injured the, his eye the week before, I think against the, against California, they had played a game at Berkeley and he was going up for a rebound and he got his eye, he got scratched in the eye and had to get stitches and ended up having blurry vision. And that mm-hmm. actually, played into the game he was actually like you said he didn't practice at all that week he came into the game still bothered by vision problems still bothered by you know double vision but he still played he had to play because number two team in the country you know he had to elvin hayes he's going against the 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 presumptive at the time number one pick in the draft so he had no choice but to play in that game yeah Absolutely. Uh, I mean, yeah, you can't, th- it was just a big challenge. He knew it was, at that point was probably the biggest challenge, even though he'd already won the national championship once that was going to be the biggest challenge of his career was to battle Elvin Hayes in a prime time match. Uh, you, you, it's just that whatever it is inside him, that warrior mentality had to step up and say, I got to play. That's right. Now let's talk about the game itself. The game actually was, it it actually was one of those rare occurrences where the game actually matched the hype. You know, talk about the game itself. Uh, well, I, uh, the game itself uh, was just obviously it was a huge battle between the two men, between the two big men. Um, but uh, I'm trying to think back to. Um, I'm trying to think back to the score. The halftime and and because uh, because UCLA got down early if I remember but um, uh, but I know that right now the, the scores are, are escaping me but but UCLA got down so they really had to fight the whole game I mean this was not a rollover team like they were used to having I mean and they knew they were in for a big fight but mm-hmm. it proved to be even tougher than what they had imagined um, so I know it was, a, it was a big back and forth I mean all eyes were on that matchup in the middle um, and what was going to happen there. But, you know, and, and during the game, you could actually tell that Lou Alcindor was having trouble, not only with the talent of oh, yeah. Hayes, but also his injury as well. You know, he only finished with 15 points in that game. Yeah. You know, well, so, you know, he, he only finished with 15 and it was it was but a lot of it. But but the but thanks to the backcourt of Allen and thanks to the backcourt of, of um Al, Lucius Allen and Jim and, uh, and, and, and Mike Warren, they were able to keep Mike close, Warren, yeah. you know, the EV, able to keep close with Houston and able to make a game of it because without those two, it would have been a rout for, you know, could because yeah. Elvin Hayes is pretty much having his way inside with Kareem, believe it or not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're always, I mean, it was always, it was always Kareem or Alcindor carrying the team and now it's the other way around they got to carry him because you're right he couldn't see his hook shot was off because his his vision was blurry uh so and that's I mean, he wasn't playing a- in the astrodome without you know with, <laughs> with, with the big space and everything that that, that would throw everybody off but yeah, for it, some it, reason houston was able to deal with it better than the ucla could yeah i think uh, center had everything going against him from the eye to the background uh obviously off of his game and and uh uh, yeah, he really needed that backcourt that night. You know, you had other guys that you, for the University of Houston. You know, we, we touched on the UCLA starters, but Houston starters, you had Elvin Hayes. You also had another future NBA guard in Don Chaney, you know, and then you also had Kenny Spain and Theodos Lee, who was also was the, the other that averaged in double figures and pretty much was the catalyst for those Houston Cougar teams under Coach Guy Lewis. Now, everybody remembers – Jerry Tarkani with the famous towel, but he got that from Guy Lewis because Guy Lewis would also have a towel that he would chew on during the game. I didn't know that. Yeah, he did. He was yeah. he actually had a towel that he would chew on, you know, during the game when things got tight. 
Uh, but Guy Lewis was it was the coach. Whenever you think of University of Houston basketball, the first person you think of probably is five slam a jam up, obviously, with Clyde Drexler and Akeem Olajuwon, Benny Anders, and that group from the 80s. But their coach, Guy Lewis, was a very charismatic coach, very you know, he was the total opposite of John Wooden. John Wooden was very staid, very reserved. Guy Lewis was very excitable, very, you know, in your face type of coach, but at the same time, he was very much fun to watch. And we also had that towel that he would chew on, just like, you know, Jerry Tarkanian would years later. Yeah, I tried, I, you know, I tried that once back when UNLV was winning those titles with uh, Larry Johnson and Stacey Ogden. Right. I tried to just put a towel in my mouth after about 10 <laughs> seconds. I go, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> but University of Houston, you know, had, you know, had pretty much the upper half to late in the game. But UCLA, you know, being who they are, rallied. And the game got real close toward the end. It was tied, let's see, it was tied at um, set a 69, a 69 apiece, and it came down to free throws, obviously, like most college basketball games do. Came down to free throws. And, of course, who's at the line? Of course, Mr. Elvin Hayes. He coolly hits the two free throws, and then UCLA gets the ball, right? And UCLA goes setting up for possible overtime, you know, last second overtime, but, of course, there was no three-point shot back then. Possible overtime win and take it from there. Um. Oh man, uh, this is what I'm kind of having some trouble with on this one. Um, well, well, it basically came down to an unforced error. It came to down to a turnover. It was a turnover by um by um Mike Warren. Mike Warren attempted a pass with no Lucius Allen passed it to Lynn Shackelford, who Mike Warren thought it was intended for him. And the ball got knocked out of bounds. And that's how the game ended. But oh, wow. That, that's exactly how the game ended. With, you know, with UCLA and then Houston getting the ball back and just dribbling the ball out to, to run out the clock. But those two teams would finish that season again, facing off against, one, facing off against each other one more time. And that would be in the national yeah, they were, in the sem- national semifinals, not the national championship, but yeah, the in semifinals. the final four. Yeah, and that one, uh, uh, oh, at Sindor, I see. I mean, I go back and forth between Sindor. Well, you're a Laker fan, of course you can go back. <laughs> I'm going to go by Kareem. I'm going to call him Kareem, right? But uh, uh, yeah, in the rematch in the semifinals, it was definitely the other way. You had a healthy Kareem. He could see you're in a traditional basketball space. You're not in that Astrodome anymore. And UCLA uh, came back, obviously, with with a different result, and they were able to pull out uh, the victory and then the rematch, and it kind of uh, right the ship and make up for what what happened in the first the first match up at the Astrodome. Yeah, I think they won by like twenty five points. You know, the game was at the uh, LA LA uh, Sports Arena, which was right up the street from UCLA. You know, which was kind of beneficial for UCLA, but you know, you had. Um, UCLA beating University of Houston, you know, Elvin Hayes, they, they pretty much shut him down in, in that game. Um, but in, in the game in the Astrodome, Elvin Hayes finished with 39 points. Yeah, you know, and that, that part really surprised me because, you know, Alcindor was such a good defender. Like, even with the bad eye, I'm thinking you could still play defense. You can still put your hands up. You can still disrupt Elvin Hayes and he and he really could and I, and I know like I said I know he had a bad eye but that doesn't seem to really account for how well Elvin Hayes played or or, or the lack of defense on the part of Alcindor um uh, you know maybe maybe the eye was bothering him more than than, than what maybe he let on because uh like I said because you, you well, we we just talked about it in the rematch it was a completely different story and uh, I think Kareem dominated um uh, the, the 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 rematch uh when they play for the Smith. Okay. And um, you kind of broke up there for a minute. Just um, if you could just say exactly what you had oh. said again. Yeah, not a problem. I was like, uh, the one thing that surprised me about that game is the fact that like you said, uh, Elvin Hayes had 39 points, which is very 
uncream like in terms of his defense. He had the bad eye, but that doesn't, but you can still disrupt a guy. You can still lean on a guy. You can still get your hands up, right. you know, and disrupt what he was trying to do, what, what Hayes was trying to do offensively. So you really have a cream, unless the eye was really bothering him in a way that we, he didn't really talk about. I mean, there really is, is like, what happened to Kareem? He should not have allowed Hayes to get 39. That was extremely unusual on the part of Kareem in, in terms of like a, like a lack of defense, which obviously he corrected when they had the rematch. I'm sure, I'm sure like as, as that semifinal game was coming up, I mean, the only thing he could think about is probably replaying the Astrodome game over mm-hmm. and over in his mind, going, what can I do differently on Hayes uh, this next time? Now, I've always said that this game here – was kind of like the catalyst for that was like one of the many catalysts I think going forward that produced our passion for March Madness do you you know kind of agree with that that this was like one of the games that kind of set the stage for what we normally enjoy doing doing March and with March Madness and the NCAA tournament with you know two teams going at each other we don't have a bowl system like they do in college football but this is like the beginning of what we would enjoy as March Madness do you agree with that I I, yeah I think so because you have the first time as you said the first time that a college basketball game was put on prime time national television so I think what that did by itself it opened up the eyes of the network executives to say yes as as if, if we have some two two big time teams, this can work. You could put these games on national television and you can make money. So you had to have kind of that mental barrier had to be broken. And I think this team, this game did that executives saw that if you get number one, number two, or, or any two teams in the top five, you're going to get eyeballs. You're going to get that ad revenue. And so then when is, when March Madness really kicked off was just with, well, I say it's with the, with, Magic Johnson and Michigan State versus Larry Bird right. and Indiana State in 79. But that's only a decade later. So from, from this game, this game of the century, to that 79 incident, you're only talking 11 years. Uh, and, and it wasn't like it was just overnight. But yeah, that, but that game of the century got the ball rolling, where college basketball is a viable television sport. Um, yeah, absolutely. They got things started. Yeah, I mean, when you think, you're right, it was 11 years later when you had Magic and Larry Bird going at it, which is still the highest rated college basketball game of all time. Um, It's for a television rating Mm -hmm. um, taking place. It was in uh, Salt Lake City, if I remember correctly. Um, But that, you know, in Salt Lake City, I mean, in uh, Houston at the Astrodome, that was the beginning. Now, now. The final four would end up in the Astrodome, I think, a couple years later in 71, in, when UCLA was in the in the height of their dynastic powers, you know, when they were winning national championships. You know, I mean, you, I mean UCLA, 12 national champion. I mean, 10 national championships in 12 years. And I think a stat that no one ever talks about, they won 37 games in a row in the tournament, which is astounding. Yeah, that. That's yeah, a record you, no one talks about. You don't see that today. You'll never no, see that, I, mean, I don't think. Bro, I mean, even today, no, even today with six rounds today, or depending, I mean, six rounds traditionally, that you're talking six years in a row. I don't see a school going six years in a row, going undefeated in the tournament. There's just too many things. When you're talking uh, single elimination, you know, one and win or go home, to get through that gauntlet of team after team after team after team, after team it's just, uh, yeah, it's practically impossible. That would, not to say that it would never happen, but it hasn't happened again. Not right. Since. Now, I mean, you thought that maybe possibly that you would see somebody like UConn women possibly getting somewhere like that. But even then, you know, the UConn you know, women's team, as dominant as they were under Gino Ariema, they couldn't match that record of, you know, John Wooden's, you know, 38 consecutive wins in the tournament. You never see that. As far as University of Houston goes, yeah. at the end of it, you know, they didn't win a national championship, but it set the stage for recruiting for, you know, for the Cougars going forward. And so, I mean, the University of Houston Cougars program pretty much was on, was placed on the map, you know, 
because, mostly because of that game, not only because of Alvin Hayes and because of Don Chaney, but also what happened and how, you know, and all the eyeballs and it had to help with recruiting. And it really helped them later on with the, you know, with five slam a jam and note in that group coming in in the early eighties. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you had, uh, by the time you get to the early eighties, they have Clyde Drexler. Uh, then they're bringing in, uh, Akeem Olajuwon from Nigeria. Uh, and I remember and I, the story that I had read was that, uh, uh, a collage was coming to visit two schools. He was coming to visit St. John and he was coming to visit university of Houston. He was going to go to New York first to visit St. John and then go to Houston. But he got out of the, uh, he comes out of the terminal. He starts to walk out of the airport. This was in the winter time. He gets to walk out of the airport, sees the snow and says, forget this. I'm canceling <laughs> St. John and just went back inside the airport. and said, send me to Houston right now. And he lands in Houston. He loves the weather. Because it's so similar to Nigeria, he said, "I'm here. I'm going." And they weren't even. He came like a day early to you. They're like, "You're not supposed to be here till tomorrow." He's like, "Well, I'm here now." Let's go. <laughs> and, uh, well, so they couldn't. They could not be happier. That's right. Look, so Rick, tell me what you have going on as far as you know your podcast and what are the things that you talk about on your show. Well, my show, Basketball History 101, we we like to cover kind of the history of the game, how it developed. So, you know, the very first, so we go all the way back to 1891 when the game was invented in in Massachusetts. Uh, We spend a a number of episodes talking about the way the game developed in the 1910s, the 1920s. I talk, I have episodes on the history of the dribble because when basketball first started, dribbling was not part of the game. It was... It was you You receive the ball uh, on a pass and then you pass it to the next guy because you're not supposed to run with it. Like, because the original rule said you cannot carry the ball. Correct. And so that means I can't run with the ball. I catch it. I got to pass it to the next guy or shoot it. And then some guy found the loophole. The loophole was that if I'm bouncing the ball, then I'm not carrying it. So I'm not technically breaking the rule, but I can move around as long as I'm bouncing it. And there was like a, a, a whole conference of the powers that be at the time. We're talking like 1897, 1898 going, should we allow dribbling or not? So we talk about some of the development. We talk about the barnstorming days of the 1920s and the 1930s. And then as the national level leagues start to come around in the 1940s, like the NBA started in 1946. Uh, and we just go through the different history and it's not all professional. We, we have episodes on college basketball. I have a couple on high school basketball, about one episode on, the real who I call it the real Hoosiers, the high school team that was the uh, uh, the inspiration the, the, to yeah the, the inspiration call it the Milan Miracle yeah the Milan Miracle was back in I think it was fifty one or fifty two it was Milan High School in a little tiny Milan Indiana they were like a farm height like a like an agriculture like out in the sticks where the in the agriculture community um, and so there was a tiny high school now unlike the movie the high school the the Milan team the real Milan team they were at the state tournament the year before and lost in the semifinals. So they were a good team. They were coming back with fully expecting to win the tournament. They knew they had a couple of good seniors returning. Um, So it wasn't, uh, uh, it was still called the Milan Miracle because they were such a tiny school, Um, but they were a good squad. They, they, they were not them winning it at the time was not considered an upset. Oh, cool. But, but I'm sorry, but yeah, overall it's just all these little, you know, we try to, I, I say, you know, we we uh, uh, were the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories uh, from basketball history, and that's what we're trying to do: is just bring back these older stories to keep them. I'm kind of bringing the old, bringing the old school back for the new school audience. All right, I mean, that, that, that sounds interesting, especially with the one with the uh, the drip. I listened to that one; that one was really, really awesome. You know, with that, and um, also many other projects that you're currently working on as of right now. Well, mostly, no, I'm mostly just sticking with that, just trying to keep doing research. I work with my with my teenage son on the podcast. He's my editor. So I, re- I, I research, write, and record the episode. Then I hand it to my my, uh, my son, who's trying to do it, you know, between studying for his, for his school. He's still in high school. Uh, he edits them, posts them, put, you know, puts them out there. So that, just, just keep researching, keep writing. Um, so that's just our, our kind of our one ongoing project that we have right now is just to, is to stay with the podcast, put out an episode. Every week, every Tuesday is a new episode. Um, yeah, so just trying to just keep that 
the ball rolling and, and coming up with new ideas. I think we've got between the two of us, we've got about a hundred story ideas and wow. uh, that we, we keep a list of all our future ideas. So yeah, that list is about like a hundred, a hundred future episodes that uh, we've got to get to. Wow, that's very ambitious. And and Rich, again, I am a I am a big fan, and I really really appreciate you coming on board with us tonight. You know, we're talking about the game of the century, UCLA versus Houston, 1968. Man, it was a great pleasure meeting you, and a great pleasure talking to you tonight. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it, Dana, and, and what you're doing, and you know, with the Sports History Network. Uh, it's just uh, yeah, it's great when we can support each other. So I, I appreciate you having me on. Oh, no problem. And we'll be right back after this. Hello and welcome back to the program. I'm Dana Augusta, your host, and you are locked into the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast, where we talk about the best names, best memories, and best moments in sports history on a weekly basis. And before we get on with the rest of the show, one sign that we are growing here at Historically Speaking Sports and the Sports History Network, for that matter, is we have a sponsor, and that is Newspapers.com. If you're listening to this podcast, you're probably a serious sports fan like myself, and if you are into sports history, you need need to check out newspapers.com at newspapers.com you can get access to over 640 million pages worth of news from the united states from canada england scotland dating back as far as 1798 now to get a free subscription to newspapers.com you could do this by visiting the sports history network.com slash newspapers and with a paid subscription you'll be helping to support the production of this show as well as so many others here at the sports history network once again, that website is sportshistorynetwork.com slash newspapers. Also, please check out our Twitter feed at historicallysp2 for your daily dose of sports history. And also, you could drop us a line or two at our email address, which is historically.speaking.sports at gmail.com. Once again, that website, that, that email address, historically.speaking.sports dot sports at gmail.com and finally don't forget to, don't forget to hit that subscribe button wherever you hear this podcast so you can get new episodes every week so right now this is our this week's top five where we count down the five historic moments in sports history from the dates of january the 16th through january the 22nd and all these moments are very significant so without further ado here we go number five Kobe Bryant scores 81 points versus Toronto. On January the 22nd, 2006, that night, the sports world was actually transfixed on what was going on in the NFL. The Pittsburgh Steelers and the Seattle Seahawks had just punched their tickets to Super Bowl 40. And the NBA slate of games was relatively light because of what was going on in the NFL. That's where everybody's attention was. One of those games on that light night in the NBA was the Toronto Raptors visiting the Los Angeles Lakers at the Staples Center. Now, when the game ended, many fans there in attendance and those that watched the game on television would not soon forget it. That night, Laker guard Kobe Bryant, already a legendary player with the Lakers, tallied 81 points in their 122-104 win over Toronto. It was the most points ever scored by a Lakers player in the history of that franchise. A franchise that includes the likes of Magic Johnson, Jerry West, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Elgin Baylor, and George Mikan. Some of the true giants in the history of the game. It was also the second highest point total of an, in NBA history, only behind Will Chamberlain's legendary 100-point game in Hershey, Pennsylvania in 1962 against the New York Knicks. In slightly less than 42 minutes of game time, Bryant went 28 of 46 from the field and 18 of 20 from the free throw line. Number four, George Foreman wins the heavyweight championship. 
On January the 22nd, 1973, billed as the Sunshine Showdown in Kingston, Jamaica, Joe Frazier, the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world, took on top contender George Foreman for the WBC, WBA, and the Ring Magazine heavyweight titles. The fight, taking place at the National Stadium in Kingston, lasted only two rounds with Foreman scoring a technical knockout with a minute 35 remaining in the second round to claim the heavyweight belt. In total, Foreman knocked the champion down six times. Foreman would successfully defend his titles twice in dominating fashion. First, he knocked out Jose Roman in the first round in September 1st of 1973 and would follow that up by knocking out future Hall of Famer Ken Norton. Foreman would eventually lose the titles in his third defense against Muhammad Ali in one of the most famous fights in boxing history, dubbed the Rumble in the Jungle. Number 3. Al Davis Joins the Raiders on January 18, 1963, a little-known assistant coach from the San Diego Chargers named Al Davis is named head coach and general manager of the Raiders. Now, at the time, the Oakland Raiders were known as the Orphans of the East Bay because the team was often cash-strapped and had no permanent home stadium in the Bay Area. When Davis took over, he changed the uniform from black and gold to their iconic and menacing black and silver. He found a temporary home in Frank Ewell Field in Oakland until the state-of-the-art Oakland Alameda County Coliseum could be built and in the process turned the team around. In Davis' first season as head coach, the Raiders went 10-4, rebounding from a 1-13 season the year before, and which turned out to be one of the greatest single-season turnarounds in pro football history. The Raiders organization continued to improve throughout the 60s, including going 13-1 in 1967 and claiming that year's AFL championship and their appearance in Super Bowl II. Number 2. The U.S. Olympic team boycotts the Moscow Olympics. On January the 20th, 1980, President Jimmy Carter announced the U.S. would boycott the 1980 Summer Olympics in Moscow because of Soviet Union's invasion of Afghanistan. As a result, a total of 65 countries that were invited to the Summer Games that year pulled out as well as the likes of China, Japan, Canada, Argentina, and South Korea. As a result, Soviet athletes dominated the medal stand. The Soviet Union claimed a total of 195 medals with 80 of them gold. In fact, the top four countries in the medal standings were communist-led countries, the Soviet Union, East Germany, Bulgaria, and Cuba. Four years later, when the Summer Games took place in Los Angeles, the Soviet bloc countries in protest would boycott the U.S. boycott in those Olympics. And number one event this past week in history, Notre Dame ends UCLA's 88-game winning streak. On January the 19th, 1974, 11,343 fans filled the Notre Dame Athletic and Convocation Center to watch the number two ranked Fighting Irish take on the top ranked UCLA Bruins who were the seven time defending national champs and who was riding an 88 game winning streak. A streak that began after it lost its last game which was on January 23rd, 1971, ironically against Notre Dame at South Bend. The game UCLA had exploded out to a 43 to 34 lead at the half and had a comfortable 70 to 59 lead with three minutes and 32 seconds remaining in the game. However, late in the game, Notre Dame, coached by legendary Digger Phelps, rallied. Along with future NBA All-Star Adrian Dantley and the shooting of John Shumate and Jerry Brokaw, the Irish rallied to make the game close. With 29 seconds remaining, Dwight Clay, who finished with only 7 points, hit a jumper from the corner to give the Irish a 1.71-70 lead. The Bruins would get one more chance as UCLA star Bill Walton would have the final shot and after a mad scramble, the Irish would get possession as the clock ran out. In the biggest men in program history, the Irish had snapped UCLA's 88 game winning streak and earned a place in college basketball lore. Now that concludes this week's top 5 events in sports history dating from January 16th through January the 22nd. And coming up after the break is our shout out segment. This week, we're going to send a shout out to the man that is credited with breaking the color barrier in National Hockey League, known throughout the NHL as the Jackie Robinson of ice hockey. We'll be back with that story right after this.
and we're back with our final segment of the show, which is called our shout out. And this week's shout out goes to one of the most important athletes in the 20th century that unfortunately not a lot of people know about. Yet this former NHL player and pioneer paved the way for the likes of Mike Marzen and Grant Fuhrer and Jerome McGinley, Wayne Simmons and P.K. Subban. I'm talking about the Jackie Robinson of ice hockey, Mr. Willie O'Ree, the first black player in the history of the National Hockey League. On January 18, 1958, O'Ree was called up by the Boston Bruins when they faced the mighty Montreal Canadiens in the Boston Garden. The Bruins won the game 3 to nothing, but O'Ree had made history as the first black man ever to suit up and play in the National Hockey League. He had a long career in pro hockey that included long stints in the minor leagues, which included him winning the scoring title twice between 1961 and in 1974. He returned to the NHL and the Bruins in 61 and scored four goals and 10 assists that season, which was by far his best season in the NHL. Though his playing career in the NHL was short, his impact on the game has been long-lasting. On June 26, 2018, O'Ree was inducted into the NHL Hall of Fame in Toronto as a builder of the game, and his number 22 was recently retired by the Bruins. But his legacy lives on in the National Hockey League as a growing number of black players are following in his footsteps of this hockey pioneer. So that does it for this show, and thank you guys for listening, and don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to this podcast, and also please feel free to drop us a line here at historically.speaking.sports at gmail.com or on our Twitter page at historicallysp2. Thank you guys for listening, and until next time, so long. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday's Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.